All right, you fine CPA candidates. Here we are running through our multiple choice questions for our analytical and other procedures. Although they'll primarily have to do with analytical procedures. Let's run through them, get some good practice, get you confident for this exam. Starting off, which of the following items would be considered an analytical procedure? Now, this is just my judgment based on uh, a lot of questions I've seen. This is probably going to show us an analytical procedure and then show us a bunch of substantive procedures, which we know usually going to be different there. So we got to watch out for that. That's a possible trick. We could also possibly see some tests of controls. So just things we want to watch out for. First off, evaluating management's plans for dealing with adverse effects of recurring operating losses. That doesn't sound like it because, well, what is an analytical procedure? These usually compare prior and current year balances to find unusual variances. And that doesn't sound like what we would be looking for for an analytical procedure. Uh, and actually, you know, I'll take this, this time here. If you were forgetting it, this is from our lesson. Here are examples of analytical procedures. If you want to pause this, take a look before uh, we run through, feel free, but I'm going to get back to it. I want to eliminate letter A. This is, this is something you, like, these are all items you could do. Like, there's no reason you wouldn't do any of these. It's just, this is not an analytical procedure. Projecting a deviation rate by comparing, okay, so this is sampling. That's not an analytical procedure. It's already talking about sampling. That's, that's involved in sampling procedures, but not here. Examining a sample of paid vendors invoices. So this is substantive procedures. This is us verifying the accuracy of some numbers in the financial statements. So that would be substantive procedures and as such, it wouldn't be analytical. Lastly, developing the current year's expected net sales based on the entity's sales trend of prior years. That sounds pretty spot on to an analytical procedure. And let's think about the purposes of these. A lot of times you'll do analytical procedures in planning. You're trying to get a general idea of what the numbers should look like. So that is kind of what we're looking at in letter D right there. So good example. All of these other ones are good examples in their own way of everything. Um, and you know, this would be, I guess I addressed this as sampling. This is substantive procedures. I would say letter A, this is gonna be more so dealing with uh, actions taken by the auditor with regard to mitigating going concern issues. That's if, if we want to make sure that our going concern issues are properly disclosed. How is management dealing with adverse effects of operating losses? Making sure we understand where all of these potential answers fit into our studies. Next question up here. Let's take a stretch, take a breath. We'll run through them. We're having a good time. An auditor who performed analytical procedures that compared current year financial information to the comparable prior period noticed a significant increase in net income. Cool. That's the purpose of analytical procedures to look for changes in certain uh, accounts, certain transactions. Given this result, which of the following expectations of recorded amounts would be unreasonable? I think about little journal entries, right? Think about journal entries, how this would play a role. Okay. So net income, we're going to think of revenues. We're going to think of expenses. Uh, what other items? Well, retain, retained earnings is a factor because, well, guess what? The higher your retained earnings go, the it's probably because you have a higher net income going on there. Let's take a look. Well, we see a decrease in notes payable. Well, I don't really see how notes payable would affect net income there, um, right? I'm trying to think, I mean, if you saw a, you know, a decrease, I mean, if you saw accounts payable, I would think that's, that's much more uh, likely to affect your net income because we think about that, if accounts payable is, going down that has or going up let's say that has to do with expenses so that would decrease net income so I, i'm gonna actually put this one on pause for a second probably come back to it uh, a decrease in accounts payable so these two now one one note one thing i have to say about these two because they're pretty much the same thing now i know i was talking about accounts so accounts payable what's the difference accounts payable this is going to be what you owe based on business transactions right you're usually going to debit expense credit accounts payable when you buy something Notes payable is essentially just everything else. So accounts payable, right? That's going to be, okay, we bought some supplies. We bought some materials for our manufacturing. Notes payable could be like an IOU for you know whatever reason that might be. But because these are essentially the same thing, I'm going to cross these off because if one of these is true, then the other one's probably going to be true. And we can't have two of the same answer. So multiple reasons why I wouldn't like these. There's also a decrease in accounts payable. That just means you're like 
how are you decreasing accounts payable? You're paying it down with cash. And if we think of the journal entry, these would both be a debit to the respective liability accounts and a credit to the cash account. And that doesn't affect net income at all because we're accrual basis. So multiple reasons why these are wrong. They get from all those angles, use whatever helps you to answer that. Now we see a decrease in retained earnings. Okay, well, we know that retained earnings is tied to net income. However, if we're noting increases to net income, we know that net income goes into retained earnings. That's the process, right? Revenue minus expenses equals net income. Net income then goes into retained earnings and then retained earnings generally gets paid out through dividends. But if we are seeing an increase in net income, we would expect to also see an increase in retained earnings. So that, that could be our answer, but let's leave the last one. A decrease in cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales. Well, if cost of goods sold, which our expenses are going down, that could also result in an increase in net income. So this, this would be a legitimate answer. So the first two just are unrelated. This one does explain why this could happen. So that's not unreasonable, but letter C, that's quite the opposite of what we would expect. There we go. Final answer is letter C. Always trust the journal entries. The journal entries don't lie. Next question up here. Which of the following procedures would an auditor most likely use to identify unusual year end transactions? I don't know. You tell me you are the expert candidate here, but you can't because I'm recording this. So unfortunately, I will have to answer it for you. All right, so let's see which of the following would they most likely use to identify unusual year-end transactions. Testing arithmetic accuracy of the accounting records. This is a substantive procedure. And because it's a substantive procedure, this is generally going to just test like specific account balances. This isn't particularly going to identify unusual year-end transactions. So I, I don't really like that at all. Uh, performing analytical procedures. that. Sounds like a decent answer, um, right? Because during the course of the audit, the auditor is going to search for business transactions that are outside the normal course of business for the entity, particularly at or near year end. Why? Well, sub subsequent events. Uh, also, that's when weird transactions could happen is, oh, we realize the numbers aren't uh, great for the year. So we want to at the last minute at year end affect them, right? The client might try to skew the numbers. We want to be concerned with those unusual year end transactions. That would be something the performing analytical procedures would assist the auditor in identifying transactions, right? So if we normally like throughout the year have, uh, you know, 5% expenses, and then all of a sudden at the end of the year, it shoots up to 50% expenses. Well, why is that? You know, we want to see like, okay, if it's a normal company that doesn't have a crazy amount of seasonality, it should have relatively stable percentages throughout the year, right? Like we shouldn't, you know, have, have like a, a, a super spiked increase amount of, let's say revenue at the at year end, if we just had normal business expenses, normal business activity, right? So I would say it's looking like that. Uh, and then obtaining a client rep letter. Well, this, no, not at all. This is something we have to do. And this is something that happens before we accept the engagement or like as we accept it, right? So I'm gonna cross off that one and a legal inquiry letter. Um, okay, so you might think, you know, that could be the answer. Um, but this is not going to identify, you know, any possible unusual year-end transactions. This could really, this would really just be contingencies and commitments dealing with our you know, possible lawsuit, something like that. So it's not all encompassing. Like this could help you to find something strange during year end, but that's not the purpose like of this action. This is something you're going to do to identify contingencies and commitments. So it's looking like it's going to be letter B. I actually got a snippet from our nice lessons here to look through, right? Pause it. You want to read through it if you don't remember it from our lesson. But we see here that analytical procedures, this is going to help you identify unusual or unexpected balances. Now, the year end specificity of this question, not 100% necessary. I mean, you're going to do analytical procedures to find unusual transactions and just because it says year end, you know, not, not essential to the question. Um, so that is going to be our final answer here. You're going to use analytical procedures to search for unusual transactions throughout the whole year, but you're going to be extra cautious of potential year end transactions. Again, just because that's well likely when unusual transactions would happen when management's trying to uh, you know hide something, they're trying to deal with some problems that they, uh, they discover during year end. So that is what we're looking at there. Let's move on to the last question and knock it out of the park. Which 
Of the following results of analytical procedures would most likely indicate possible unrecorded liabilities. Ooh, I like this. We're applying our knowledge and saying, okay, let's be a little analytical here. Let's think about this for a second. Okay. Which would most likely indicate possible unrecorded liabilities. So we're thinking, what is the relationship between liabilities and another account? We're thinking something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like this one. I'm just, I'm reveling in it. I mean, I, I know I'm the one who picked these questions out to go through, but yeah, I picked good questions. All right, let's work through it. So first off, we're seeing ratio of accounts payable to current liabilities of four to one compared to six to one for the prior period. So we see, okay, this is the point of analytical procedures. We are comparing this year's with last year's. And in this case, and we could also you know, possibly use which one of these is not like the other. I like that approach. Um, so accounts payable to current liabilities. So it looks like we have more accounts payable last year. Now this year it's gone down because last year we had, let's say $6 of accounts payable for every $1 of total current liabilities. And now this year we have $4 compared to one of total current liabilities. So in this period, in this year, we have less accounts payable. So that could indicate that they're, on being on, they're not being recorded. They're trying to hide them. It's possible, right? It, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the case, but the question's asking could possibly indicate these unrecorded liabilities. So I'm going to leave A on the table because, again, just, just to recap that there, last year we had more liabilities, and because that's gone down, and that's a pretty decent amount, right? Like 6 to 1 compared to 4 to 1, that's a decent amount. Uh, I mean, most of these will be decent amounts, but, you know, that, that's something we would uh, consider. Current ratio of two to one as compared to five to one for the prior period. Well, what is our current ratio? A second. Well, Dora the Explorer, uh, I see the question, give you a second to think about it. Going once, going twice. All right, well, if you said your current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities, you'd be correct. So in this case, it's saying that prior period, we had current assets of five to one liability. And in this case, it's actually looking, looking like the amount of liabilities we have is going up because we have less assets compared to liabilities now in the current period. So for that reason, I'm going to X this one out because if anything, this is recording more liabilities than last year. And this is not like a tried and true process, right? This is not going to say definitively, oh yeah, you've got extra unrecorded liabilities. What we're just trying to find here is based on last year because things will generally fall in line with last year. Based on last year, which of these possible answer choices shows that we have less liabilities compared as compared to last year? So I'm going to cross off letter B there because in this case, we actually have more liabilities as compared to assets. Now, accounts payable turnover of five compared to 10 for the prior period. Give you a second to think about it. What is our accounts payable turnover ratio? I want you to have these memorized. Now in this exam, a lot of times they will be given. Uh, but I mean, if you saw a Multiple choice question on the exam, it's not given. Sims, yeah, they could give you the ratios, but in this case, on a multiple choice question, you're not going to be given the actual ratios. Going once, going twice, making sure you have these memorized. Your accounts payable turnover ratio is going to be your total credit purchases, which is total expenses, divided by your average accounts payable for that period. Is that going to indicate possible unrecorded liabilities? I'm going to say the lower the accounts payable turnover ratio, while it could indicate financial distress because it's showing that we're not able to pay back our bills, it wouldn't necessarily indicate unrecorded liabilities. And then lastly, for letter D here, accounts payable balance increase greater than 10% over the prior period. Now, this is just saying, as compared to last year, we just have more liabilities. So like this one, we're saying, okay, if liabilities are going up, that wouldn't particularly indicate Unrecorded liabilities, that just would report, that would indicate more liabilities. So best answer here is going to be letter A, because that indicates that there are less liabilities as compared to last year. And because there are less, it could mean that we maybe have the same amount. The company just didn't record them. And they're trying to hide them. That is the point of what we're doing here. That is fully exhaustive thought process of it. And I hope you enjoyed. I'm having a good time here. Hope you are as well. Keep studying up strong, and I will see you all in the next one. Hey there. Are you ready to not only pass your CPA exams, but truly understand and enjoy the material while studying? I know it seems impossible, right? Especially to enjoy the material. We'll do it together. Tap into the power of cpa.examprep.ai, where we've got personalized quizzes, multiple choice questions, memorization guides, flashcards, simulations, 
all tailored to your learning. Our adaptive study planning puts you on the fastest path to success and lifts you back up if you fall behind. Avoid wasting your precious time and money attempting an exam with a low chance of passing because who wants that? We want to get you through this process as quick as possible. Our exam readiness prediction lets you walk in with confidence knowing that you're prepared for success on exam day. Thankfully, there's no payment method needed to get started. So why don't you come join us? Visit cpa.examprep.ai and let's achieve your exam success together.